Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. Um, I know many of you are at a conference right now, so hopefully that's going well for you, and I hope you have safe travels. So today we're going to talk about herbal medications, and I wanted to record this lecture because it's such an important topic. Um, a lot of people use these medications, and they don't know the whole story behind them. They don't know what they're taking. So it's going to be important for you to know about this because many of your clients are going to be using these medications. Also, I use the term medication not by accident. You know, these these are, in a lot of ways, they're drugs. They have the same effect on the brain as many of the other drugs that we've talked about so far, as you'll see. So with that, um, there's this belief that anything that's herbal or natural is safe and it's not a it's not true it's um these are drugs just like the other drugs we've studied they have side effects and as you'll see they're not held to the same standard as other medications so with that in a way they're actually even more dangerous potentially so in 1994, there's the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act, which said that any product that's labeled as a supplement um, can be labeled this way, as long as it doesn't claim to cure a disease. Um, that should say to cure a disease. Sorry about that. So this is why on Radio Edge you constantly hear that you know this product is not intended to treat, cure, or prevent any disease. It's so they don't have to go through FDA and get approved. So these medications are not reviewed. Um, they're not tested for efficacy. They're not tested as far as their side effects. They're not regulated in that way. So that's why I said these can actually be more dangerous, substantially more dangerous, because they're not regulated the same way. Also, I thought the book did a really nice job talking about how there's so much variability in what you get with these where um what it says in the label the amount of the ingredient you it says in the label is often not what's actually in the pill so it it's a dangerous area it's in it's kind of the wild wild west but people don't view it that way people view this as safe and we know that a ton of people use these medications of uh, it's estimated about 18% of Americans in 2007 reported using herbal medications. And a majority of them did not tell their physician about it. And as you probably got from the reading, looking at some of you know, all these medications, many of them you know, significantly affect the liver and affect the way that other drugs interact and other drugs are metabolized. So... That's really important for a physician to know. And the fact that most are not telling their physicians is really worrisome. And it's part of the reason why we need to ask about herbal medications. Um, because if we don't ask directly, we're probably not going to be told because people don't think of these as drugs. They they think of them as vitamins and and but they're drugs, you know, let there be no mistake. So there's some research and Again, I think um, I think the TED does a really nice job at talking about the research for each of these, but it's really difficult to study um, the efficacy of herbal medications. So part of the reason is we don't have a complete knowledge of the active ingredients, so we don't know exactly what works or how it works. It hasn't been studied that much. And part of the reason it hasn't been studied is that herbs can't be patented. So there's not an incentive for a drug company to study this stuff because they can't really make money off of it. Anyone could, you know, create the same thing. So why why put the money into it? There's not standardization. Uh, you could get two pills for the same thing, you know, ginkgo biloba, from two different companies and have very different ingredients inside, uh, very different purities inside. And then also there are also variation in plant conditions and parts that are used. So these are um, just a brief table. Um, let me switch back and forth. So this is actually from Juan 1998. This is a really good article. Um, 
a brief table kind of showing many of the medications we're going to be discussing and the quality of the evidence supporting them. So again, just jumping back here. One is for evidence from at least two properly done randomized controlled trials. A two is evidence from a well-designed trial without randomization. A three is opinion of respected authorities based on clinical experience. And four is saying insufficient evidence to warrant conclusions about safety or efficacy. So here you, you can see there is some evidence for a lot of the things we're going to be talking about. So Dinko, you know, there's some evidence. We'll talk about it. it you know, there have been some, well, we'll talk about Dinko when we get there. Um, Kava, we'll talk about, you see, not as much evidence for Kava Kava as um, some others. I think one of the ones you're going to see a lot of is St. John's Wart. And so that'll be important to talk about. I mean, it's a drug, it's effective, um, but there are some downsides to it as well. So why, why do I have this? Well, there is some empirical support for these medications. They do work. Um, many of them are drugs just like what you get in a prescription. So most, many of them work, many of them work above placebo, but with that, just remember they are drugs um, and we don't know their mechanisms, we don't know their safety nearly as well as the ones that are FDA approved. So St. John's wort. St. John's wort is actually um, a flower that's named after John the Baptist because it blooms around his feast day. And we don't know exactly what the active ingredient is. Um, it's probably hypericin, but it's not clear. And it was originally believed to ward off evil spirits. So what does St. John's wort do? Well, it's often used to treat depression. That's the biggest thing. And it's, there's some, you know, there's some possible reasons why this could work. So there are aspects of it that work like a MAOI. Um, it will inhibit monoamine oxidase, but it's not a strong inhibitor. So this effect, at least on its own, is probably too weak for clinical efficacy. There's also some belief that it may block the reuptake of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So in doing so, it's kind of like a tricyclic, but there's not strong evidence of this. It may also have an effect on GABA and glutamate, and the thought is that there may be, it may be neuroprotective in some way, but honestly, we really don't know how it works. Um, and I've been harping on this about other medications all semester, but it's really the case with these herbals. We really don't know how they work because there's just so much less research done on them. So indications. In Germany, it's actually um, licensed for, tr or it's approved for treatment of anxiety, depression, and insomnia. Um, so that's good. Even though you'll, as we'll talk about in the next slide, really the most empirical evidence out there for it is depression. Um, we'll talk about that on the next slide. In the U.S., um, it's not FDA approved, so you can't claim medical effectiveness. So you can't say that it's going to treat depression or treat anything, but you can talk about it in terms of um, you know, positive behavior. So it may help promote emotional balance or emotion regulation or something like that. Something that's not directly tied to a disorder. So with this, there's not a strong of evidence for treating anxiety disorders, especially OCD and social anxiety. So I bring this up just because a lot of other antidepressants, as you know, are really effective for treating anxiety. Uh, this isn't one of them that's going to be especially good for that. So when you think St. John's Ward, it's really about depression. That's where the most evidence is. But, well, 
I did what well, I keep wanting to get ahead of myself. There's just so much to talk about with us. So a couple problems. One is it and contains these um bioflavonoids and these inhibit the metabolism of certain enzymes in the liver. So or so what happens is it causes interactions with other drugs. It will reduce the effectiveness of codeine. It increases blood levels of caffeine, antipsychotics, tricyclic antidepressants. Um, third one's really important for your female clients. It reduces the effectiveness of birth control medications. So you can imagine that's, you know, that's not something that your client would likely know, but it's important for them to know. And also it, can also, it can also reduce blood levels of some cardiac and anti-inflammatory drugs. So there are side effects. Uh, photosensitivity, so sensitivity to light, um, especially in those who are fair-skinned. Uh, you can have hypomania. Um, basically, it's, it's like an SSRI. It's, you can have people switch. If, if you have someone who's um, meets criteria for bipolar, you can have the switch with this medication. You can have serotonin syndrome. So, again, how this is working, we think, is we it's increasing serotonin levels. So, if you have someone that's trying to use this as a adjunctive treatment, so in addition to an SSRI, says, especially something like Patzl, um, you can have serotonin syndrome from too much serotonin. Uh, sedation is um, possible, feeling lethargic, uh, GI upset, you know, those aren't terribly common, but they're notable. And then really the drug interactions, I think, are the biggest thing that I want you to know about. Um, this is not, it's not without um, downsides. I mean, as the book really emphasizes well, there is evidence that these work, especially for mild or moderate depression, which is really interesting because that's where we see that SSRIs sometimes struggle. But, um, you know, there's many studies, you know, it's a mixed literature, but when you look at the meta-analyses, many of them show that St. John's wort is more effective than placebo and is not inferior to antidepressants. So this works, but when you looked at the side effect profile, I th I think you're hard pressed to say that it's not significantly worse than a SSRI. So people are basically prescribing themselves SSRIs or you have an antidepressant here with significantly more side effects, and they're not aware of them, which is problematic. So. Anyway, again, I jumped ahead of myself. Can it treat depression? Well, it's mixed, but most of the meta-analyses say yes. Um, especially for mild to moderate depression, there do seem to be differences um, that are significant from placebo. But it, much like the other antidepressants, the results aren't robust, but, but really, they're not that much worse than other antidepressants either, honestly. And in general, it's not as effective for dysthymia or for anxiety disorders. So it's really a depression-only drug. Ginkgo. So ginkgo is actually one of the oldest deciduous tree species on Earth. And it's used in Europe and... Um, promoted in the United States for treating dementia and other cognitive disorders. So again, we can't say in the U.S. that it's treating anything. So what we will say is that it's, it increases mental sharpness or it helps with antioxidants or helps maintain healthy, you know, circulatory performance. So again, not focusing on the disorder it's meant to treat, but focusing on hopefully positive um, results of the, of the medication. So we don't, again, really understand what active, what's going on with it, you know, what's active. But 
what we do see, similar to what we saw with um, with St. John's wort, again, you have these flavonoids that inhibit um, enzymes that cause drug interactions. So with that, we do see drug interactions. We'll talk about that. The other thing is it um, inhibits platelet aggregation. So it actually has it decreases blood clotting, much like aspirin does. And that will be important. We'll talk about that in the next couple slides. So what are some of the side effects? You know, you don't have horrible side effects um, other than you do have to watch the drug interactions. But you have mild headache, mild GI, uh, some increase in bleeding because, again, you're basically taking a blood thinner. Um, and you can have spontaneous hemorrhage, but that's pretty rare. So how does it improve cognitive effectiveness? How does this drug actually work? Well, there are some EEG studies that show that you have higher alpha wave activation. So you have more of those fast waves that you have when you're alert and you're awake. And the thought is that it may, this may be improving cognitive performance in a way that's similar to caffeine. However, the studies are mixed and ambiguous. Uh, so Solomon and colleagues found that there's no effects on learning, memory, attention, or concentration, whereas Mitz and Cruz found, you know, using almost the exact same tests, modest improvements in memory and concentration. So literature's really mixed on um, Ginkgo. So overall, what you know, what would we say? Ginkgo might have modest effects on cognitive function, um, especially those related with cerebral vascular impairment. So the thought is that it improves blood flow um, in the brain. And really, this is likely attributable solely to the herb's ability to reduce the stickiness of the blood. So it basically has the same cognitive imp um, improvement as you'd see with aspirin. Um, that's at least our thought right now. But again, there's a lot we don't know just because there's not a lot of um, research on, on this. Kava, or sometimes known as Tava Tava. So Kava is used by the people in the South Pacific uh, for social and ceremonial purposes. Basically, it's very similar to alcohol. Um, so it's an anxiolytic. Um, and with low doses, you're going to have relaxation, improve social interaction, promote sleep, higher doses, sleep and stupor. So again, very similar to alcohol. So with this, edge threats have been used um, therapeutically in Western countries for anxiety, tension, restlessness, and insomnia. Pretty much, again, the same thing, same reason people use alcohol. Uh, the pharmacodynamics, so how does this work? We don't really know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, stop me if you've heard that one before. Um, we don't fully know the mechanisms of how this works, but what seems to be happening is that the Tava uh, pyrons are binding to GABA receptors or benzodiazepine receptors. So they're acting much like you know, benzodiazepines or alcohol would. They also are blocking sodium channels, um, which also are, you know, slowing things down in the brain. So it's been shown to be a muscle relaxant and also an anticonvulsant. And EEGs are very similar to taking benzodiazepines. So side effects, you have drowsiness, nausea, muscle weakness, blurred vision, you know, a lot of the same things you'd expect. It's also a sedative and intoxicant. You don't want to take this and then drive. Again, think of it much like alcohol. Um, bigger side effect is hepatotoxicity. So it can cause liver failure. And because of that, it's actually banned in Germany, France, Switzerland, Austria, and Canada. But it remains legal here. And to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't have age restrictions. I might be wrong on that, but I don't think it does. So you can go and get this substance that can cause liver failure as, you know, in high school. You know, you, it, 
doesn't have it's very similar to alcohol in a lot of ways but it doesn't have the same restrictions of alcohol the main difference is it's more expensive but it's kind of concerning so it's one it's one to keep an eye on Ephedrine. Um, ephedrine's been banned for quite a while now. It's been banned since 2004, so I won't talk about it too much. But basically, it was a potent uh, such a stimulant. So it would release the body's catecholamine neurotransmitters that would you know act very similar to amphetamine. So it amp things up in the brain. Also, it's being used as a dietary supplement because it would you know get things going and also reduce. Um, reduce hunger. But with this, it had some dangerous or potentially lethal increase in cardiovascular activity. So that's why it's been banned. It's, if I, I believe it's um, the only stimulant that's been banned in the U.S. and it's because it's, it is just so dangerous. But again, these aren't regulated by the FDA. So there are there are stimulants out there that are going to be, they're likely to be more dangerous than medications. Um, they're still out there because they're not regulated. But this is just one where they pulled it because it's just so dangerous. Omega-3 fatty acid. So this is where you, this is why you'll finally understand why I always talk about fish oil as my example for a lot of things. Um, a lot of promise here. Um, I think, at least. We'll see if you agree. So, with this, it's not as much that it is changing brain chemistry, or um, at least not that we know of. Um, it's not as much that it's acting like a drug, but more so that this is a substance that's really needed in the body that we don't get. Uh, so we omega-3 fatty acids are prevalent in um, ocean, wild ocean fish, but we don't eat that much in Western diets. So we typically have def deficiencies in Western diets. Uh, during pregnancy, that's one of the reasons why you're supposed to do prenatal vitamins. Um, during adolescence, childhood and adolescence and it's important for brain maturation and we also see deficits in many adult disorders such as mood cardiovascular problems chronic pain so the thought is that perhaps um, perhaps the deficit of this perhaps not having uh, these fatty acids are you know a potential cause of some of these problems so during pregnancy, omega-3 fatty acids are very important. They're required for normal fetal development and optimal maternal outcome. Um, so fish are a good source of this, but also you have mercury and other toxins to worry about. So often um, to address this, pregnant women are given a, they're told to take a certain amount, usually around 200 milligrams a day in order to help with um, fetal development, especially for neural development and retinal tissues. Now, use with children and adolescents is always a bit iffy, but um, again, there's indications that omega-3 fatty acids may be deficient in children and adolescents, and also it could be related to many different disorders. So the thought here is that small doses likely cause very little harm. And there has been some efficacy shown in autism spectrum disorders, um, helping with allergy risks, and also developmental behaviors. Um, the results are more met with ADHD. Um, and then there hasn't been much research with psychosis, but there we'll talk about more when we talk about children and medications, but there was a landmark study that showed that for individuals with subthreshold psychosis, having taken omega-3 uh, fatty acids was correlated with a reduced likelihood of transitioning into psychotic disorders. So that's really cool. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that replicates, but that's still an early finding. One change I made from the slides that I sent out is that 
it said that bipolar use in bipolar disorder was uh, well supported. Um, as we talked about when we talked about bipolar, initially was really well supported, but more recently the data have really been mixed. Um, probably you don't have a lot of side effects as we'll talk about with this, so it's still, it still still may be worthwhile, but it's just more mixed for what it's worth. Uh, use in unipolar depression is controversial as well. It really hasn't been shown to work well as a monotherapy. There's just, not that it doesn't work, but there's just not enough research on it yet. But it has been looked at a little bit more with um, being an augmentation strategy. So having this in addition to a SSRI, for instance. And the thought here is that given the low risk of taking omega-3 fatty acids, it may not be a bad augmentation strategy, you know, just something to add on in case it helps, because it's probably not going to hurt. And um, it also has an analgesic effect, so it's used for rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and other painful conditions. It can also be helpful for neuropathic pain or anything with pain. So with that, um, it's really worth considering for people that have pain taking omega-3 fatty acids because it's very likely that these are um, not being sufficiently obtained in a Western diet. It seems to have beneficial effects on cardiovascular health. So if you take 500 milligrams a day, um, it's been shown to... Um, help um, protect the, tar the heart. Also, with weight loss, it's been shown to help reduce triglycerides. And there's also at least a little evidence that it may help reduce dementia cognitive deficits. So here, there's research that if you started early, there may be um, up to a 50% reduction in dementia risk. So that's pretty good. Um, it's at least worth looking into. So as long as it's a reasonable dose, the potential benefit very well may outweigh the risks. That said, with all this stuff, since I am putting this in YouTube and it's not just for my class, um, always consult with a medical doctor before taking any of these. But there is at least some research showing that omega-3 fatty acids may be helpful for a lot of different things. So it's they're worth considering. I don't take them, but I probably should. So here are a couple um, resources for future reading. There's the Wand article I mentioned, and also the PDR for herbal medications. Um, I just really encourage you to study up on these, get to know them, because your clients are going to be using them. And you have to know, you have to know about them because of that. Because many do have side effects, and they do work. You know, we're not gonna. They they do many of them do seem to work, but they don't work without side effects. Many of them. So it's just important to be aware of that and to help educate your clients about that, um, because they, we know most won't tell their physicians, so. It may, you know, we may be the ones to identify it and help make them aware of some of the potential side effects of taking these herbal substances.